Awesome. So let's dive in. So firstly, I just want to welcome everyone to our first panel. So education is really to share case studies across the environmental industry, to learn new tips and tricks, and also to empower other environmental professionals on their Power BI and data analytics journeys. So Christian and I, we've both um, transitioned into the data analytics and graphic design industry, uh, but we come with about eight and 10 years experience working as environmental engineers. So we thought that there was a really good opportunity to um, have a meetup like this where we can share examples with other environmental professionals around the data space. So while we say it's Power BI for Enviros, that's our tool of choice, that's our favorite analytics tool, but uh, it's open to any other data analytics or visualization tools that people are keen to share in this space. So our first, for our first event, we've got um, a bit of a packed agenda. Uh, Christian will start by giving us an introduction into Power BI, and we'll both walk through a couple of examples of how we're applying Power BI uh, to the environment industry. Uh, then I think we'll have uh, Jared. Jared will be presenting on a couple of, on a water sensitive urban design study. And then Lachlan will be presenting um, the COVID-19 water security risk index Power BI report. And at the end, um, we'll have uh, all of the questions at the end of um, the meetup. So we've reserved a half an hour block for open panel discussion, questions, um, and also ask the experts. So any tricky Power BI questions or data analytics questions, please throw them our way. We've got Daniel Marsh-Patrick joining us from uh, Christchurch. So he's an MVP of the data platform, specialised in Power BI and custom visuals. So, um, And it's not just Daniel, we have other people on the line as well. <laughs> yeah, we'll yeah, we'll open up. Cool. So just a bit of housekeeping before we get started. So um, the idea was using the Teams app for the best experience. So please mute yourself um, when you're not speaking, like most of you have done on the call, so thank you. Um, feel free to type questions in the chat, but as Alice just mentioned, we'll address them all at the end as part of the panel and the Q&A discussion. Um, we do encourage video on during the panel sort of discussion at the end. Otherwise, yeah, please turn your video off. Um, for those people with experience in using Power BI and Teams, it can be a bit slow, so hopefully we don't have any bandwidth issues. And just for everyone's reference, this session is being recorded and will be shared afterwards on the YouTube channel and also in the meetup group. So thank you. Before we jump into the first bit, uh, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional landowners from where Alice and I are presenting. Um, so that's the Wurundjeri people who are the traditional custodians of this land. and like to pay my respects to the elders, both past, present and emerging of the Kulin Nation. And this is a photo of me taken a few weeks ago along the Yarra Bank. So quite lucky to live in a beautiful uh, part of the world. So yeah, over the past month or so with the five kilometre bubble of COVID restrictions, it's been quite nice and quite lucky to sort of live in this space. But yeah. And are you going to take it? Oh yeah. So um, for those of you who joined early, um, we've been sharing a link, um, a short survey link. It's in the chat if anyone wants to um, also participate. This is just to see who we have in the room today. So let's take a look. Let's see. Just refresh this. Cool. So we've got. Um, oh, yeah, responses. Wow. Yeah, we've got lots of responses coming in. We've got quite a few people who have dabbled in Power BI, but they're not don't consider themselves an expert yet. Got a couple of pros in Power BI and one person who hasn't heard of it until now, which is awesome. So the data analytics tool of choice is a clear winner for Power BI. We also have some Excel and R and Python users. Um, quite a few people work in a different industry. So thanks for joining us. Uh, we've got people who are a bit of a mix across the environmental industry, lots in the water management space, which is where we work a lot, and environmental risk. Loving some uh, of these comments. Yeah, so Daniel's the second degree black belt in karate. Awesome. So there's heaps of comments here. We might come back and um, revisit this at the um, end in the Q&A panel as well. So please just keep sending them through and we can share the results um, at on the meetup page as well. So welcome everyone. And uh, just before we dive in, just a 
big thank you to the event sponsors, which is Discovery AI. Um, so Discovery AI, it's a data analytics and visualization. <laughs> I see Daniel laughing. Company uh, uh, specializing in Power BI for the environmental industry. So Christian and I are the co-founders, along with Daniel on the call, and our fourth team member is Renat. He's based out of Europe. So we specialize in Power BI training and mentoring, custom visual development, end-to-end -end BI reporting, infographics and animations, and also custom web apps. And just to say a big thank you to all of you for joining today, we've got a 10% discount on um, any of our virtual training courses as well. Cool. So let's dive into it. So today with the first session, Alice and I are just going to take you through uh, an introduction to Power BI and just share a few environmental case studies. Um, so who are we? As we touched on before, uh, my name is Christian. So we're both the co-founders of Discovery AI, as well as also being husband and wife. Um, I'm a Microsoft certified trainer in uh, Power BI, as well as in uh, solutions associate as well. Um, formerly worked as an environmental consultant, so an environmental engineer with 10 years experience. And over the past few years have um, yeah, transitioned more into the data analytics and design field um, where we sort of apply these skills in uh, at Discovery AI. Uh, and I'm Alice Drummond, I'm a Microsoft MVP for the data platform. And um, yeah, like Christian, specialize in Power BI and graphic design. I previously worked as a water resource modeler, so doing surface water and groundwater modeling for an engineering consultancy. And outside of Power BI, I'm also on the Australian Water Association YWP committee and the Women in Biz Apps committee as well. Cool. Okay. So based on our experiences working as an environmental engineer, the following was a typical sort of workflow for our projects, where you collect data, whether it be from the field or the lab, use a suite of different analysis tools common to environmental people, such as ESDAT, ArcGIS, and largely Excel. Your end results is you communicate these results for a range of tables, charts, maps, and other visuals, and produce this project report. But then inevitably on our project, something always changes. We have more data coming in. We need to revisit a modeling scenario or assess more results. And so then you have to follow this sort of similar sort of workflow again. And we found that along this process, there's a lot of a manual steps and the end result is a project report that's quite static in nature. And so we're using Power BI, which is Microsoft's business intelligence platform, to really collate, analyze, and visualize this information. Where through Power BI, you've got the ability to connect to a whole range of different data sources common to the environmental field. You can use Power BI as a house to transform, load this data, and also perform your internal calculations produce these really rich interactive reports and visualizations at the end where you have the ability to share with your project team or your various stakeholders through different methods such as in recent months upgrades to Microsoft Teams and Power BI integration as well as also SharePoint or you can publish to the web and share with the public and the community in that way. But probably one of the best features of all for environmental data is the ability to automate this workflow as new information becomes available through refreshing uh, this process. So Power BI really is four main components. You've got a database, so where you use to combine and transform data from a whole range of different sources. You have the analysis engine, where you can perform streamlined calculations and really interrogate your data. What most people see and are familiar with is Power BI is the visualization, so the front end, where you can create these interactive visuals and reports and dashboards that can be used as decision support tools. And it's a really powerful collaboration hub where you can share reports securely, either in the Power BI service and collaborate with your peers and colleagues, or you can embed them into websites. And Power BI, it's, um, while it's amazing in isolation, it actually sits within the Power Platform ecosystem. So it integrates really nicely with Power Apps, which is your uh, mobile app collection tool. Power Automate, which people refer to as the glue. It, uh, it allows you to automate uh, different data transforms and updates. And also Power Virtual Agents, which is Microsoft's kind of bot framework. And outside of the Power Platform, Power BI sits within the Microsoft Office 365 environment. Uh, so what this means is that we can have, uh, it integrates really nicely with other 
uh, Office products that you're used to. So you can have the Power BI, Power BI app now embedded in Teams. Uh, you can embed it in SharePoint, uh, send out alerts and updates to Outlook, integrates really nicely with Excel and OneDrive, and also exporting to PowerPoint. You got the next one? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Forgot about this. Um, so that was uh, that was a bit of a snapshot of uh, of Power BI and how it fits into the to the simplistic ecosystem. But taking one step back away from uh, that, you can see that Power BI is actually an extremely powerful and well connected tool. This um, this uh, infographic here was developed by Melissa Coates from Coates Data Strategies, and it really provides you an overview of just how broad Power BI can be. Uh, we won't go into the detail. We don't want to scare anyone here, um, but it is good to realize that it does have a lot of awesome capabilities um, and the ability to integrate across your whole uh, data analytics ecosystem as well. So this is just a short video that will play now um, with a few just different project examples for Power BI for the environment and water industry, where you got the ability to create these infographic style reports to communicate your data. You can embed animated schematics to help explain complex environmental systems. You can connect maps, so the spatial context, with the data that we collect, which is really powerful for environmental studies. It's not just quantitative information, it's also qualitative data, like we've shown in this survey feedback report. And it's got a whole range of powerful visuals to really help tell that data narrative and uh, communicate the key insights you know, from, from the projects that we work on. So in today's session, uh, for about 10 minutes, Alice and I are just going to run you through a demo now. So we're going to present uh, two Power BI reports and show you a few cool features in them. Both of these reports are using synthetic data sets, so don't get too carried away with the information, but it's more the techniques used to be able to communicate the data. And the first one is a water balance that we've um, developed across the greater Melbourne region. And the second one is a Power BI report focused on groundwater quality risks where we'll um, showcase the uh, geological bore log custom visual. So without further ado, let's get into the demo. Let's get up here. Uh, yeah, that water balance one. Yeah. yeah. Cool. OK, so where I've just navigated to is the Power BI online server. So we work within the Power BI desktop application, and then we can securely publish our reports to this online service. And we have here a water balance report using synthetic data that tries to answer the question, how do the trends in water balance vary spatially and over time? And so what you can see from this landing page is we have the ability to update these numbers by changing the date slider here. And we've got a series of different visuals down uh, in these bookmarks to be able to then um, explain what the average annual water balance is across different regions across Greater Melbourne. So this is the synoptic panel visual where what we've done is you can click on an area, say groundwater, and it filters the data accordingly. And you can connect up different sort of um, water balance components, such as diversions uh, for supply, and then also demands, um, such as we've done here with uh, urban demand. And you can connect your data and understand it further in relation to um, the, the area that you're looking at, uh, communicated here schematically. We also have a uh, time series matrix as well, where we use conditional formatting across the entire date range that we're looking at. You can also use really cool visuals, such as the uh, quite recent one, decomposition tree, which allows you to um, really dig in to different categories and pull levers on your data to be able to understand how it impacts in this example as the average annual water balance. But it's not just this particular, these visuals that we need to um, communicate for this report. I also want to be able to show these trends across uh, time series. And here we're only showing the results for the base climate modeling scenario. But I know that we also have two extra um, climate scenarios that we've evaluated for which we want to show the results for as well. So working within the service here, what you can do is you can collaborate with your peers to provide this feedback. Whereas I can click on this matrix and add a comment. And I can actually say to Alice, it pops up, that we need to show more scenarios and time series information. 
And what that'll do is that'll send an email to Alice, let her know that a comment's been made on this report and she can jump in and make the update. Awesome, thanks Christian. So let's go ahead and make these updates. Let's have a look. So now I've navigated to the Power BI desktop. So this is where we do the majority of our Power BI report development um, and data modeling. So you can see it's quite similar to, um, to Excel. You would have a desktop application. I'll quickly walk through the key components of Power BI. So I've just launched the Power Query Editor. So this is where we connect up to our different data sets and we can do different transformations to shape the data to get it in a format which is ready for modeling and manipulating. So once we've connected to our data in the Power Query, we can import it into Power BI Desktop and we can start building out our relational data model. So you can see that a relational data model, it's just um, uh, different tables connected together with a relationship. And then if we take a look at the report view, this is where we build out our visualizations here and um, we can also check our DAX calculations. So you can see here I've got a matrix visual. Um, it's reading in different fields from my data model here. And one of those fields is actually a DAX calculation. So DAX stands for Data Analysis Expression and it's just the calculation language of Power BI. So it allows you to write um, some very simple um, and also very advanced and complex calculations so you can interrogate and analyze your data all directly within Power BI. So, yeah, so you can see that we've got um, just one scenario here. We only have the base climate. Um, and in my previous role being a water resource modeler, uh, we would never just model one scenario. We typically model 10, 20, 100 different scenarios about what the future um, outlook for our water supplies is looking like. And analyzing a lot of that information in Excel um, was often a bit painful. Uh, so one of my favorite features about Power BI is its ability to streamline data transformations and automate the process. So you can see I've just got one CSV file in this folder that Power BI is connecting to. I'm gonna go and bring in a couple more CSVs. So let's imagine I've just run my model two more times for a dry and a wet climate change scenario. So I've copied those CSV folders, files into this folder. Now back in Power BI desktop, I'm just gonna hit refresh. So behind the scenes, what Power BI is doing here is it's connecting up to that folder importing that additional data and updating all of the calculations and visualizations behind the scenes. And you can see um, if we build out our workflow um, correctly, then the process, it just works. We can import, we've imported a couple of it, additional scenarios here. All of our calculations are fully dynamic, they've all updated. And if we take a look at the data behind the scenes, what Power BI is bringing in, you can see down the bottom here, that we have one point, close to 1.4 million rows of data being brought in. So Excel struggles, I think it conks out at about a million. Uh, Power BI, it has a really big capacity. So that was a quick demo on how we can bring in additional uh, data sets. That was using a Power BI connect to folder where we're importing uh, CSVs with the same file structure and appending them one on one. So now let's, uh, let's tackle Christian's second question, which is all around a time series chart. So um, it's really good to present data um, both in a tabulated format, but with our environmental data, it's always really good to analyze the data over time to have a look at the fluctuations. So using the visuals over here, we can quickly build out um, a visual. So I've just selected the time series chart here we can bring in our average annual water balance as the values. You can bring in your dates as the x-axis and we could plot this by the different scenarios. But let's say that we just, um, we didn't know exactly what type of chart we wanted to create. And let's imagine I'm a manager. I'm not really savvy with Power BI. I just wanna ask a question of my data. So here I've just launched the Q&A visual. Um, and this is one of Power BI's uh, AI visuals, which are getting better and better over time. 
So the question I want to ask of my data is what is my average annual water balance? Water balance by scenario. You can see it's creating it on the fly, but I want to see this over time. So you can see um, Power BI, it, it's converting my question into uh, the fields in my data model. It's linking it up. It auto corrects for lots of my typos all the time as well, which is amazing. And it's um, selected the most appropriate visual for this data set. So I'm going to convert this visual uh, from the Q&A into a standard visual on the canvas. So you can see it's converted it into a line chart here. And just one more feature of Power BI I'll quickly walk over is the ability to aggregate data. So just like a pivot table, um, we can bring our data into a pivot table and aggregate data up to uh, year or month or daily intervals. We can do the same types of aggregations within Power BI really easily. So at the moment, we're just visualizing the data at a daily scale. If I just drag in the financial year up here um, for my access option, you can see that the uh, that Power BI aggregates the data up. Now we're seeing the average annual water balance for each financial year. And then we can drill into the finer detail and have a look uh, over time at the specific um, daily time step here. So that was a pretty simplistic uh, water balance. With a little bit more time, we could build out a bit more of a complex example. Um, here we've got an example where we've built out a bit more of a decision support tool. So by using a bit of, a bit of DAX with some what if parameter slices, we can uh, create uh, those future scenarios on the fly within the water balance itself. Sure. And so just to dive a little bit deeper into this complex water balance. So it shows similar sort of information to what we had before, again, with synthetic data sets. But what we built in here is the ability to use what are known as these what if parameters or sliders, where we can assess on the fly um, the impact to our annual water balance if our population was to grow or change by a certain percent, similar to climate impacts across our different regions and also assess this over a future time period of our choice. And we can see the data um, across a few different visuals. So here we're having a look at how the water balance is trending, including the forecasting. We can filter based on this matrix for a particular area. So here, if I click on Werribee, it will zoom into this region of interest and then it updates these visuals accordingly. But the other thing as well is this particular Power BI report just looks at water quantity, so quantity of water in the future. What if we're also interested in, say, water quality, and in particular, groundwater quality, um, such as groundwater being a supply component to Werribee here? One of the cool features in Power BI is the ability to set up what's known as cross-report drill-through, which allows you to connect up or link two reports that have a similar, um, the same table name and the same column name as well. And so we've actually done that with this report. Whereas if I right click on groundwater, you can see an option for drill through to what is a groundwater quality risk Power BI report. And because I had Werribee selected on the previous report, you can see that it auto filters these visuals for this Werribee region, and then it zooms straight in. I should also say this is again, synthetic data set and uh, used for demonstration purposes only. If we want to clear these uh, these filters, you can click on this reset to default up in the top corner and then it'll remove it from all the visuals and then show us all the data. So this is just a bit of a splash landing page um, for this particular Power BI report. We can click on this feature here um, to navigate to the more detailed page. And what we see at a glance is we've set up here a um, groundwater quality concentrations risk table and use a technique known as conditional formatting to be able to compare the concentrations to an individual threshold value. We can filter these visuals based on selecting different analytes that we have across our, um, that we've sampled for and that we've tested for. And you can see that it's all interactive. And then, yeah, there's a lot of different features. We can still filter into the actual map as well and extract the information that we need. 
But quite often, as we know, with groundwater quality or water quality in general, um, we need to also understand with the groundwater what's happening below the surface. And that's where having visuals such as um, the geological bore log to be, understand, to be able to understand the stratigraphy and the geological layers and how that might be impacting on these results is quite a powerful um, technique. And so we've set up now a placeholder page to be able to go through and set that up. Awesome. So let's see, let's see what this geological bore log visual actually looks like. So I'm navigating back again to the Power BI desktop. Bring that one over here. And so this is the same report that Christian was showing us in the online service. If we have a look at the data model here. Um, you can see that we've got information on the bore details, our groundwater quality sampling, um, but what we're missing here is some information on our geology. So I'm going to go and get some more data. This time I'm getting it um, from an Excel workbook. So we'll just browse to our... Oh, is that frozen? It's just... Yeah, there you go. Oh yeah, just a little bit slow. Let's browse to our groundwater data set here. And just while that's loading up, um, while I've connected up to previously, I connected up to some CSV files. Now I'm connecting up to Excel. Um, it's important to note that Power BI, I think it has over 250 different connectors. So you could typically connect up to your SQL Server database um, or any Azure services. It has a whole heap, which you can do as well. So what I've just brought in here is um, some information on the bore logs. Uh, that's automatically linked up to my relational data model here. Um, and I've got some standard lithology as well. So the information we've brought in, if we just take a quick look. This is very typical for hydrogeologists and geologists where we're um, going out on site, drilling literally just some holes in the ground and logging what the soil looks like beneath the ground. So over on the right hand side here, you can see we've got a lot of different visuals to choose from, and we also have more visuals available to us in AppSource. But sometimes, especially working in the environmental industry, uh, the visuals that we want, they're just not created yet. Um, so lucky for us, we can create our own uh, Power BI custom visuals and get experts like Daniel Marsh Patrick um, to help you out. So Daniel's part of the Discovery AI team, and he's created us this awesome geological bore log visual here. So just add it onto the canvas. Let's have a look at what it looks like. So we just have to drag in um, our information. So I'm going to start with my bore ID. Let's bring in our lithology. That information on the bore uh, depth from and depth to. We can also bring in our average groundwater level and information about the screen as well. So let's filter for the Werribee region here. You can see that um, we've got now a visual that we recognize or that geologists and hydrogeologists recognize. So we can see uh, the logging of different uh, soil layers uh, beneath the ground, or different geology layers. Um, but this, this looks a little bit like a splash of uh, kind of paint on the, on the canvas here. We've got a whole heap of different colors and it's really important, especially when working with environmental data to be consistent with your colors across different reports. So we've got standard colors for things like sand, clay, basalt. So within the geological bore log, you can actually bring in a color field here, which reads in a hex code and um, visualize your uh, geology the way that um, you're used to seeing it, and so it gives a bit of consistency across your different reports. So you can see we can, um, it's all interactive, just like any other Power BI visual. Uh, you can filter the data in our geological bore logs updates, and you can also do it in cool ways, um, use it in cool ways, like having a, a report page tooltip on the map um, and things like that. Cool. So this was a bit of a sneak peek of um, how we're using custom visuals at Discover AI. Um, we're just in the process of packaging this one up um, and making it available for our clients as well. So if anyone is keen on the geological bore log, uh, then let us know. 
That's it. Cool. So that was that was it from us. That was um, a quick introduction into what is Power BI and a couple of uh, ways that we're using Power BI across the environmental industry. Um, so we've got our we've got our next speaker coming up now. This is um, so I'd like to introduce Jared. So Jared is uh, the founder of Water Insights. And um, he's presenting on Power BI for water sensitive urban design. So just a quick intro into Jared. Jared's worked for um, local governments and private consultancy with a focus on asset modeling, asset management and monitoring, as well as maintenance, rectification of water sensitive urban design assets. So he started up Water Insights with the aim of bringing the latest learnings and technology, including GIS in situ monitoring and data analysis to ensure that uh, water sensitive urban design assets can be highly functional and also cost effective for asset owners. Uh, but really, in his own words, he just loves playing around with all things data, sensors and other gadgets to make asset management easier and see better environmental outcomes. So thank you so much, Jared. I'll hand it over to you and I'm really excited for this presentation. Uh, thanks very much, Alice and Christian, and yeah, thanks to Discovery Eye for um, pulling this whole session together today. So um, let me see if I can share my screen. Is that working okay for everybody? Okay, yeah, great. Okay. Yeah. So, so following that um, pretty stellar intro of what uh, Power BI can do for um, our environmental industry. I'm going to share some, uh, some maybe more simple examples around how it's been used um, in helping understand the function of water sensitive urban design assets. Um, and for people that are maybe unfamiliar with that term or what they are, um, water sensitive urban design assets um, are those densely planted uh, ponds, uh, wetlands, and sometimes sand filters. Uh, that we see in mainly urban environments to try and help manage uh, stormwater runoff before it connects back into the natural environment. Um, so today we're going to talk really quickly about what was the project, um, what Power BI tools we used, um, what went pretty well and maybe what could have been done better. Um, so the project was, was working with the city of Geelong to try and um, better understand the function of their Wusud assets um, via collection of, of field data. So sensors were installed to be able to collect um, real-time data for water depth, uh, water temperature and also electrical conductivity across five sites. Um, so the aim was really to, to capture that data to try and uh, understand in more detail key functional parameters of the assets, um, being things like residence time and how long the water is, is staying in those assets after a rainfall event, um, as well as things like maximum depths and if the assets going into to bypass. Um, questions like this, so these answering these questions can really help um, understand the asset performance in terms of its uh, intent for stormwater pollutant removal, um, and can also be really helpful for planning if works are required um, at different assets and what those works need to be. Um, so the project involved using sensors from uh, different suppliers that had sort of different data access hosting arrangements. Um, so this was CSVs that are simply stored on a web URL, um, as well as accessing JSON data um, via REST APIs. So what, what we really wanted to have was a simple, consistent uh, interface and visualizations for the data um, from the different sites, um, noting the sensors coming from different suppliers, and also be able to convert that raw data, um, particularly for depth, back to things that are, are meaningful for that asset in terms of its normal water level, um, the top of its extended detention, um, if it's going into bypass, questions like this. Um, we also wanted the data to easily be able to be automatically retrieved um, as it gets uploaded and automatically refreshed. 
Um, ideally, we wanted all that data to be accessed and shared using one um, web-based link. Um, as much as my life philosophy tends to be that Excel spreadsheets are the answer to most problems, um, it probably just wasn't going to be the best tool in this case, leading down to an avenue of trying to understand uh, how to use Power BI a little bit better. Um, so in terms of the, the processes of, of, of getting the data and some of those steps, which were sort of really nicely highlighted by um, Alice and Christian earlier, um, obviously on the site we've got the sensor and the logger, which then communicates and hosts that data online um, using the MB IoT. Um, from those web-based sources, we're able to import that data um, into Power BI on the desktop um, using that the query or the transform data functions. Um, once we've got all those reports working the way we want to, we're then able to publish that up to the Power BI service. Um, and then from there, we're able to actually host multiple reports. Um, in this case, on my own website was the easiest way to collate those all uh, for end users that often don't uh, have access to Power BI themselves. Um, so in terms of the specifics of, of the query and importing the data uh, into Power BI, um, I found accessing the CSV from the web URL uh, pretty simple. Um, and accessing the JSON data via REST API, uh, very not simple. Um, there's, there's a lot of learnings in that for me, um, not coming from a programming background, but coming from a, a civil engineering background. But that was, it was doable, um, leveraging off sort of existing knowledge from Excel. Um, so we also had the option of whether we would bring in all that data into one single Power BI report um, or potentially set up a report for each site. Um, the latter ended up being more straightforward in terms of uh, converting the raw data into meaningful data and the five reports could be collated uh, into a web page and put behind a password protected access. It, it wasn't um, confidential data, but just makes it a bit harder for people um, to get in there, I guess, that, that shouldn't be in there. So I'll open the, the web page now. Um, so you can see this is the five reports all collated together. Um, so there's sort of a lot happening on, on one page, perhaps, but it just um, provides. Sarah, just quickly, I think we can't see your second screen, so we're just seeing your PowerPoint slides. Oh, um, okay. So maybe I think you might be sharing just the window. So if you stop sharing and reshare the desktop. Gotcha. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> I would have powered on. Let's try nothing. <laughs> I think it moved just as I went to click it. How's that? Uh, perfect. Yeah, we can see that online. Great stuff. Thank you. Um, so yeah, all the there's five Power BI reports that can all come back via one web link. So very easy to share with with the client or other people, so that they can get access to their monitoring page, and from there, um, also begin to explore any individual report, I guess, as opposed to having five links and then going from there, this this was the way that that we found the easiest. Um, so you can see here for this sensor, it's all um, time series data. So we've got water level up the top here that could be related back to uh, the normal water level of the asset, as well as its, um, its bypass levels and gives you a really good idea of how long how high the water's getting and how long it's taking to drain down after events. So similarly, we've got water temperature um, and electrical conductivity. So going through very quickly what, what I think went well about the project, um, I found it pretty easy to automatically uh, refresh the data using the Power BI service. 
um, getting the embed codes and stuff to, to put into the website. It's also really easy. Um, I get alerts when um, if, if there's failure, failures in the data refreshing. Um, hopefully the the interface is is pretty easy to use. Um, for others that, that aren't as close to the project, they can come in and sort of quickly zoom around. Um, we mentioned the, the filtering of dates um, can be done sort of even without needing to expand the report into full screen. Um, also like the way Power BI, so just jumping back into the desktop version, but I'm guessing that's not going to be shared. <laughs> Is that still on the... Um... Uh, yeah, we're still on the online server. Gotcha. So let me just... Um, so jumping into the, the, the query here, um, I like the way that once you go through the process of uh, sort of connecting to one data source, say the JSON data, um, it's very easy to then just slightly change um, to another data source that's that's hosted on the same platform. So this came in handy with um, that sensor provider, their uh, API requests were limited to 10,000 data points each time. So we sort of just had a bit of a workaround where we could do multiple queries that got shorter um, shorter time durations of data for single parameters and then merge it all back together behind the scenes. Um, so that was pretty handy as well. Um, what could have been done better? Uh, Jared, just while you're in there, we just got yeah. a quick question. Um, Riz is asking if you could please show the data model of the JSON. If I, uh, <laughs> I think he means like the, uh, the transformations maybe. Yeah, so um, I, I'm not entirely sure how to answer each specific one, but this comes in and talks at the top about, um, I guess, the parameters of our request um, and the interval for which we're seeking the data, um, and then filling out information on the API keys and tokens that were um, supplied by the sensor provider. But is that the sort of question? Um, yeah, I, yeah, I think so. I think that's what um, what they had in mind. If if it's not, then they can ask at the Q and A at the end. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It was actually it's using um, the the data source being via the web contents, so similar to the CSV, but the actual um, structure of the request is a little bit different with JSON. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, they just replied and said, "Yep, that's perfect." <laughs> okay, it took me. Uh, a long time to get all those scripts to work, but um, but it did happen. So let me just quickly jump back to the Chrome window. Sorry for all the jumping around. Um, so maybe what could have been done a bit better. Um, I thought it would be really clever to set the report um, size up to 920 by 1080 to, to get a lot more on there, thinking that's a good uh, window size, but it doesn't quite fit by the time you have some uh, headers and footers and stuff like that and you sort of end up needing to scroll, which isn't super elegant. So that could have been easily updated, but haven't got around to that yet. Um, using some, some background templates for the reports also would have been super helpful. And uh, now that I've done some training with Discover AI, that would be pretty easy next time around. Um, I imagine there's also some more elegant ways to manage um, the coding in those those data queries. Uh, but again, it was sort of really handy to come just from an Excel background, I guess, and be able to make that work without having to do a uh, programming degree, I guess. So um, also converting from uh, the, the UTC format data that comes from the sensors into local time for the desktop version of Power BI. And then when you publish that back to the service, it tries to go back to UTC. It was actually really tricky to sort of get all those timestamps working, um, but that was doable as well. So we're looking to, yeah, to 
to use Power BI in a few different formats for um, other asset auditing projects and um, projects with catchment analysis. Just given that ability, it has to work with um, with spatial data as well. But hopefully that uh, just gives a quick overview, I guess, of um, of how it was used in in this project case. Oh, that was awesome. Thanks so much, Jared. We've had heaps of activity in the chat, so no doubt there's lots of questions in the Q&A. Just one quick one, um, which has come through at the end. The photos on the right, they're not part of your Power BI report, are they? Uh, no, that's that's a good point. No, they're just on the web, the web page, but I should mention um, the ability to embed um, some simple site schematics within the report that helped me understand um, I guess the sensors just collect, uh, you know, raw data for depth and then really understanding what the key water controls are at that site. Being able to embed some of that info within the actual Power BI report, um, I think is quite handy rather than having to go looking for that um, elsewhere, I guess. Absolutely. Yeah, no, it's a fantastic use case and it's been uh, well received, I take it, Jared, by City of Greenwich Long. It, it has. So we've still got a few more. I guess the the Power BI at the moment's really just being used as um, as access to the real time data and visualising what's going on. So some of those deeper interrogations on things like residence time and stuff hasn't happened yet. The sensors have been in for sort of four or five months. So there'll be a lot more work to actually pull. Um, uh, assessments out of the data, I guess. But um, yeah, I think it's great. Like when it you get a heavy downpour, you can you don't have to go out to the sites. You can just open one web link and see how all the assets are doing. So I think that's that's really cool. Oh, that's fantastic. No, it's a great report, mate, as well, especially for someone that sort of jumped into Power BI over the past you know six odd months really well. So no, thanks a lot for sharing. That was great. Thank you. Appreciate it. Nice. Um, and mate, if you're, so you're happy to stay on, Jared, for the Ask the Experts bit at the end? Yeah, as long as all the technical ones go to the uh, technical people. That sounds yeah. good. <laughs> when, when you look at the chat, we appreciate that there's a lot of people with technical knowledge replying in the chat at the moment. Yeah. So thank you, everyone, let's get that conversation going. Um, was... Lachlan, did you want to start sharing screens? And I'll just uh, I'll, I'll briefly introduce you as, you as you're sort of doing that. Yeah, sounds good. Perfect. Um, so Lachlan Guthrie is from Griffith, Griffith University and also the International Water Centre. Um, he's the project manager of the Integrated Water Management and WASH um, department and he'll be presenting on this report that you can see on the screen, which is a Power BI report for the COVID-19 Water Security Risk Index for the Indo-Pacific region, um, which is a collaborative project that he's been leading for the past six months working, as I mentioned, with Griffith University, International Water Centre, and also the Australian Water Partnership, as well as um, Discovery. I had the, uh, the the pleasure of being able to work with Lachlan and the team on this particular one. But um, Lachlan, I think, yeah, feel free to take it away from here. And thank you very much for making yourself available to present. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Christian. And thanks for the opportunity to, to talk to um, such a, yeah, like I'm looking through all the, the chat and it seems like a lot more uh, people here are a lot more of an expert than I am in um, in this regard. Um, so, yeah, as Christian mentioned, this is the, the database that I'm, the web interface that I'm showing now um, built in Power BI. I'm just going to post the link in into the chat now. Um, it's live, uh, as you can see, it's on the, the International Water Centre website there, so um, please feel free to go and have a look. Um, there's been quite a few questions about published to web I've, I've seen, so yeah, have, have a look and, and that's, that's one of those published to web reports. Um, I'd also like to firstly acknowledge that I'm, I'm presenting from Brisbane, which is uh, uh, Mianjin land, um, and I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Um, so as, as Christian mentioned, uh, I'm a project manager with the International Water Centre um, based at Griffith University. Um, and uh, yeah, so this, this, is, this is one of the projects that I've been working on for, uh, for the Australian Water Partnership uh, under the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade in Australia. Um, and yeah, it's been quite an interesting project and, and we've got this really cool interface coming out of it. 
So I'll firstly just, just run you through the interface. Um, and as I do that, I'll actually introduce the project. Um, so when you click on that link, uh, you open up into the home screen, which gives you a little bit of an understanding of what we were trying to do. Um, and what we were trying to do in this project is understand the risk that uh, COVID-19 would have on water security in, uh, in countries throughout the Asia Pacific. Uh, and then also understand how water security might impact COVID risk uh, on, on countries in the same region. So really looking at it from two angles um, and clearly with, with quite a strong water lens. So just flicking onto this about page. Um, and so this is a really cool page which explains the framework that we used. Um, so we, we broke the, the risk of uh, the pandemic risk into six uh, temporal risk elements, which essentially work uh, like stages of, of a pandemic that a, that a nation would go through. So the first being alert, uh, knowing what's happening overseas, uh, then delay the delaying the arrival of the virus into your country, contain, that's reducing the community transmission once it's in your country. Uh, treatment talks about uh, the ability to treat who's affected and also the presence of comorbidities in the community. Uh, immunize talks about um, vaccines and controlling the virus through that and then recover um, the economic recovery moving uh, after after the virus um, as I'm sure you're aware a lot of countries have gone through a recession uh, yeah so on this page um, you can click here and you get a bit more information about uh, what that particular temporal risk element is looking at and then also the factors that we've considered in trying to build build into that um, that risk rating score. Um, so another another cool thing here. So you can see this table automatically updates um, with with whatever risk element you're clicking on. Uh, in this table, we've highlighted the water related factors. This is obviously targeted to the water sector, so so those are very important. Um, and yeah, you can just see all the factors that have been considered in, in building together that risk score. Uh, so the next, next page we've got here, we've actually got two risk maps. And so we decided to use two risk maps because one looked better for uh, mainland Asia and one looked a lot better for, for the Pacific. And I'll, I'll, show you, I'll show you why in a second. Um, so here is obviously Asia. As you, uh, if you click on a country, let's say Kazakhstan, um, what you're able to do is, is down here, it updates uh, and shows the, the specific information for Kazakhstan. So Kazakhstan has a really, really good ability to contain the virus, and that is, is really driving that they are overall quite a low risk. Um, if we click on a country such as Afghanistan, um, you can see they are really high risk in, in all of those temporal risk elements. Um, we've also got here two narrative comments. Um, so the first being uh, sort of an explanation of the risk profile of that country, and then which water-related uh, interventions we would we would most likely recommend. Another really cool element here is is we've taken six factors that we think are particularly relevant uh, to the water sector, and we can highlight them. So uh, and then by going onto a visual header tooltip. Um, you can see, so, so this one here talks about economic water security and the uh, uh, yeah, country's sort of ability to recover or uh, fund, uh, provide water to agriculture for, for their recovery. Um, and you can see Afghanistan is in the bottom 20th percentile for that. Um, it gets quite interesting when you, when you look at some other countries. Um, so Thailand here, uh, quite high risk because of water related factors. But their their wash uh, water and sanitation, um, sorry, their ability to hand wash is is quite good. Water and sanitation in the home also quite good. Um, so those are those are some really interesting ways that we've we've devised to be able to quickly get a lot of information. Um, we've also got these. Uh, so this is a basically a slicer, um, and you can flick between overall uh, and then each of those. Um, each of those risk elements individually. Uh, and you can see the map updates. 
um, and yeah, you can move through and get a bit more information. Uh, yeah. So then I'll just go to the Pacific. And so we tried to use the same map for, for all of the countries, but uh, some of these countries in the Pacific are incredibly small and you just can't see them. Um, so for the Pacific, we, we have used, instead of using a field map, we're using a bubble map. Um, and so again, if you, if you click on, if you search for a country, we'll say the Cook Islands, it will zoom in um, automatically. Uh, and if we zoom in a little bit more, you can see it, it eventually shows the, the country there. So it's, it's really very, very small. Um, and so this bubble map is, is a lot better for, um, for the Pacific. And you've got the same, all the, all the same other features as, as the other map. You can flick through the elements. Um, if you click on a country, you, you get their, their risk profile showing up over here. So then the, the final page that we had in this report is, is a list of our risk factors. So this, this is uh, very important for us to be um, transparent in what we've considered uh, in, in each of those risk factors uh, and, and feeding into those risk elements. So um, what you can do here is you can search by um, individual risk elements. And again, it shows a bit more detail into everything that we considered. Uh, and why we considered it. So in terms of the ability to contain the spread, uh, the ability to isolate at home because of access to water and sanitation. And so for this one, we've got we've got a rationale, probably pretty, pretty simple, um, this one, but basically you can't uh, isolate at home if you don't have access to water and sanitation. Um, there's a metric here, uh, and this, this is a, a comment on the, um, the content and face validity. So for this one, it's, it's both reliable and uh, valid. Whereas some of some of these other ones here, this this comment is is a fairly interesting one. So uh, we've got in here a rule of law factor uh, using a, a combined a compiled index by the World Justice Project. And so uh, what we've got. Uh, is we're trying to use this this metric to explain the cap, the factor of, of a cultural acceptance to following governance governance direction, um, but that's that's got a relatively weak uh, um, uh, face validity, and so that's why it's and that's that's included in the weighting calculations. So uh, I just wanted to also briefly touch on a couple of things that I learned through creating this. Um, and so one one thing that's that's really important. So a lot of my work uh, uses data. Uh, it's so important to tell the narrative behind that story. So for example, if I were to say that Australia is rated at 0.83 in their ability to la to delay, that doesn't mean anything. Um, there's 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 so much context that needs to go with that number, um, and. It, it yeah it doesn't mean anything to anyone who's not prepared to spend a few hours reading the the methodology section of the report. Um, and so it's it's really important that once you've got these these numbers here, uh, you tell the narrative story that that is supported by those numbers. And that's what what we're able to do in with these comments here. That's that's really the most valuable thing uh, when looking at from the country level. Um, so uh, before um, before doing this project, uh, I did a bit of training with Christian and Alice, uh, and that was super helpful because I was able to understand uh, what Power BI could do, um, and uh, and then you know give them direction uh, and and also help them in building this this tool. Um, I can just imagine that if I didn't know what Power BI was able to do, the the work that they would have to do to, to skill me up would have been quite significant. Um, and and also an added benefit is is they they no longer need to do any of the maintenance or, or running of this this tool. Um, it's all done by me, uh, and and I can I feel very comfortable doing that. Um, and keeping in mind that probably three months ago I'd never heard of Power BI, so um, doing pretty well in that regard. So another thing that I that I learned is uh, this 
this is uh, this tool has been viewed uh, by over a thousand people in, in many different countries. I haven't checked the numbers recently, but it's it's a very popular tool. Um, and so the and you can see it's quite professionally presented. The the communication side of that. So all those refinements took such a long time. And so I was sort of expecting that once you have a few of the visuals, um, the numbers going into them, then that was sort of the majority of the work. Uh, and that's that's been a, a significant learning for me. So when you're when you're doing something that you want a really nice professional finish on, it um, it takes a, a heck of a long time to do those final refinements. Um, so we have uh, in the meeting um, in this webinar, Daniela from from Griffith is here, and so she she did a lot of help. Uh, she provided a lot of help to me with with that, um, and uh, was was able to to um, she she actually provides the the publish to web function for for this report as I'm I'm not able to do that. Um, another another interesting thing that popped up during this uh, this project was the requirement of accessibility. Um, so we did this work for the Australian Water Partnership, but they they received their funding from the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. And so what can often happen, um, and, and has happened quite a few times in um, in various projects that I'm working on, is you you complete the proposal, you get you get the contract, and you start working on the project, and uh, with with the funder, but then uh, the 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 partner um, in DFAT in this case comes along with a really important requirement, and accessibility was was one of those things, and it was really hard to integrate into into the into the interface as it wasn't a consideration that we had at the beginning. Um, yeah, so uh, those kind of things were, were really quite challenging. Um, Alice, thankfully Alice and Christian took most of that work off, off my shoulders. So I was very thankful with that. Um, and the last the last thing that I learned is that it's so important to test on different browsers. I use Google Chrome all the time. And so when I was doing my original testing, everything worked fine and smooth. Um, but then uh, when, when other people started looking at it, particularly in Internet Explorer, um, there were so many issues. And, and that was something that we then had to sort of uncover the bugs and, and work through. Um, I found it quite ironic that Internet Explorer, Microsoft's project, uh, Microsoft's program is actually probably the worst for viewing Power BI, um, and and so that was, um, yeah, that was that was quite quite interesting. Um, so I just noticed the um, there's a comment there from from Daniel about the color ranges, uh, and and yes, you're exactly right. So we we fiddled with these color ranges quite a lot to make sure that um, they were uh, they were used they were able to be seen on different types of color blindness. So you can see it's not a typical red to green, um, and and that's why we needed to to take into account color blindness. So where do I hope to sort of move move forward with this? Um, so when I when I did my PhD, um, one of the things that I was told is. Uh, I would be lucky if four people read my my thesis, and that would be myself, my supervisor, and my two reviewers. Um, and that's something that really sort of stuck with me, and I really hated. So I'm sure we've all done these really long reports, and as soon as you're done, the reviewers look at it, say this is great work, and then they put it on a shelf, and no one ever looks at it again. Um, and I think that that's just such a really huge waste. Um, whereas doing a web interface like this. You can you can get the the information much more uh, accessible, particularly for casual users. So if you want to just have a look at this for two three minutes, um, find out some details about your your specific country, um, you can do that. Uh, you don't have to wade through this you know uh, almost hundred page report. Um, and yeah, so so using that uh, this tool for this this project. Um, it sparked a lot of conversations in my centre, and uh, there's a, there's quite a few discussions about how to incorporate this kind of uh, this a, a bit more into into our data visualisation and reports in in the future. Um, yeah, so uh, that was all I, I had. But yeah, thanks thanks for the opportunity to to present um, here, Christian and Alice. Awesome. Oh, thank you so much, Lachlan. That was a really good recap. Um, 
and it's such an important study as well. So it was a privilege to be able to work on this one together with you and it's awesome to see uh, just how far you're taking it as well. So well done. Um, before we dive into the Ask the Experts um, panel, uh, where hopefully everyone has all of their questions prepared, I'll just share the screen again. I just want to touch on one of the points that um, that was raised around the colour blindness. Get this one up. Sorry, we're on Christian's computer. He's got a 4K screen and we're going to a very low resolution screen over here. So there he is. Oh. oh. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Cool. So this is, um, uh, these were, this is a traditional kind of uh, red and green colour palette here. Here we're viewing it in coolers. This is actually the colour palette we had to start with. Within coolers, it's um, great. You can actually test for the colour blindness within the app itself. So you can see that red green um, colour ramps, they are notoriously bad for a lot of different types of colour blindness uh, conditions across the whole spectrum. So with a tiny bit of tweaking, this is actually the uh, colour ramp that we came up with. And you can see that you can really uh, distinguish the different colours for the very common types of colour blindness. So it has slightly different hues, and I think it also looks a little bit more modern than the traditional kind of traffic light colour. Um, but tiny tweaks like that can make a whole world of difference to making sure that your Power BI reports can be um, viewed and interpreted by um, all of the different types of report consumers out there. So yeah, no, it's a very important point to make. Cool. Um, and just before we dive into the Q&A session, just a little bit of a plug for our next session, which is happening in uh, November, so 17th of November. Uh, we've got a, a similar to this session, we've got um, quite a few case studies. We've got Douglas Debrito from Waikato Regional Council in New Zealand. He's presenting three different use cases for Power BI, including water accounting and quality assurance checks. Um, I'll be giving a bit of a demo into my top five tips for bringing data to life. So all the fun stuff, embedding GIFs, animations, pictures. Uh, we've got Justin Perry joining us. He works at CSIRO. He's presenting on a really interesting use case of Indigenous-led AI in the Kakadu National Park and how they're applying Power BI to this as well. Um, so I've seen this presentation before. It's excellent. Very excited they, for that one. They bring in they bring in all these different tools from across the whole Microsoft stack, including sort of Azure Cognitive Services, and bringing it into Power BI. And there's some really, really, really cool things. So I'm looking forward to Justin's presentation. And then we have Philip Meng from the Water Corporation um, in Western Australia, and he's going to present some of his Power BI applications for the water industry. So I know on the call. Now we've um, got a few few people from various water corporations across Victoria. So yeah, next session, I think it'll be good to understand the West Australian perspective of some of the ways they're using Power BI. And if anyone is keen to present at a future session, um, we're looking for all sorts of presenters. So um, not just case studies, we'd love to get some kind of masterclasses, lots of tips and tricks and hands-on examples. Um, uh, this community, um, for yourself, so we'd love to get a whole range of different presenters. Um, and we're, we're recording these sessions, so if anyone wants to watch it um, again or share it with friends, uh, we'll post a link in the meetup group, but it will also be on our um, on our blog and our YouTube channel at Discovery AI. So without further ado, I would like to open up um, the room for questions. I know we had a lot of questions as we went through. Um, We've collated a couple of those uh, just in a Word doc as well. Um, so we'll have uh, Lachlan and Jared on the line answering questions about their specific case studies. But we've also got Daniel Marsh-Patrick, our special guest. He has uh, 18 plus years experience working across the Microsoft stack. He's an MVP for the data platform based in Christchurch. Custom visual developer extraordinaire. So he has a couple of certified custom visuals on the marketplace, like the violin plot, the small multiples. His uh, new one, which is the HTML content, is awesome. And also the Discovery I ball log, very cool. Not on marketplace yet. <laughs> um, he loves craft beer, playing guitar, and has, was it two black belts in karate? Or um, I have two black belts, but it's actually Cooksaw one, not karate. Oh, sorry. So okay. it's, a Kore it's a Korean martial art. It's a bit obscure, but... It's it yeah. 
Awesome. So don't mess with Daniel. <laughs> no, don't worry about that stuff. <laughs> Awesome. So with that, um, I invite everyone to go off mute um, or ask out loud or just um, uh, write in the chat as well if you do have a question. So I see that we've got uh, Haida. Have you got your hand up or you're just saying hello? I have my hand up. Hi. Um, Hi. So I work for um, agricultural, but um, I'm uh, for the uh, federal government but we now merge with environment so I have a bit of both and well, my question is to Jared um, particularly about the images he had in his um, uh, Power BI presentation because we collect um, say you know surveillance information about you know um, you know the tree with this particular weird bug in it and so on and we'd be really li like to actually to display that picture with say the that long or the collection point and things like that um but i don't i'm never worked out how to do that and remember google earth pro could do that but i don't think i didn't even think power bi could do that so i'm just wondering how you got those visuals to associate with uh yes sorry is this talking about um the the maps that had the sensor location embedded in the report or yeah photos that were on the um the web Hey. The photos on the web, were they associated with, like, the yeah, points yeah. or...? That's a good question. So on the web page, the photos are really just um, dropped into a slider. Um, but I often use... Uh, Osri's got a... Re like, their Arc Online has a really good um, photo map tool that might be worth looking at that makes it really easy. If you just upload your photos into something like Flickr you can, and geotaggings on your device, it basically just drops them all in for you, or if you're using um, like a desktop version of uh, ArcGIS or QGIS, they've got plugins that can make it really easy to um, to drop in uh, geotagged photos as well. But um, it, it probably looks like I'm cheating a bit on that website there. <laughs> it's not really using the, um, the geo-referencing of the photos other than the fact they're associated with that uh, monitoring site. Uh, okay, no, that makes a bit more sense. So if I say had a site which had multiple photos and I wanted to showcase a slider against those, um, that could be done that way. Uh, I think so. I, uh, sorry, Alice and Christian will probably have some, some good ideas as well. Uh, yeah, well, if you're looking for one in um, inside of Power BI, probably our go-to visual for having a photo gallery is the card browser. So that's a custom visual available free on the marketplace and allows you to have um, a gallery of all different photos and you can include metadata with it as well. We use it a lot for environmental assessments. If you want a photo on a map, you could include a photo as a report page tooltip. So when you hover over a specific location, it will bring up a little window with your photo. So we've actually mm. used that with report page tooltips. If you have another custom visual with it called the play axis, you can get a scrollable um, kind of gallery style photo log say you have five photos for one point um, yep, so in that would be ideal because we're collecting those photos but they sort of remain in a, in a word report and it'd be nice to actually put them up there and, and showcase the the diversity of landscape across yeah, our sites there's yeah. also some custom visual developers um, organizations known as CloudScope. They have some really, really powerful um, custom visuals for images as well. Just if card browser doesn't tick all your boxes. I'm not sure. Daniel, yeah. did you have any others that you thought? Um, yeah, I'd say card browser or the CloudScope image one. And there's a couple of others as well. But yeah, the CloudScope one's really, really good. <clears throat> But yeah, yeah, you can either, I think with the, either, of, either of those, you can have um, a URL to an image in your data or the what we call the, the base64 data, which is the raw image represented as like a big blob of text. Um, and either of those visuals will render them. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. No worries. Great question. Um, does anyone have another question opening up to the floor? Don't be shy. Um, otherwise, Christian's got a whole list of. Oh yeah, I'll pull up our word doc. Where are you? Um, so. No, no, no. No, no. 
Uh, there was a question from Vivian. I'm not sure. Vivian, are you still on the line? Just about the yep. map maps. Hi, everyone. Hi. Hi. I'm Vivian, uh, would you, yeah. yeah, would you like to just explain um, your scenario? You have a Mapbox um, app and you're wanting to use that in Power BI? Uh, no. So uh, usually I yeah, the question here is that I have an existing web application which uses Mapbox. And uh, the thing here is that I have a dashboard in my Power BI desktop. So I'm uh, like clear on that thing is it's that I have to publish it and then I get an iframe and I can then just embed that into my existing app. But my question here is, for example, it's a kind of geospatial app. And if I draw a polygon or if I select some filters, so uh, with so I want to uh, apply those filters in the app as well like the Power BI. Yeah, I reckon maybe using Power BI embedded. Um, Daniel, what are your thoughts on that? I would agree. Yeah. Um, yes, I think anything else, you're not going to get the interactivity that you might want to might want to have. Uh, typically with Power BI embeds, they are basically a big square in the page and they just show up. Whereas there's a product called Power BI Embedded, which is a bit more, uh, you need a bit more developer now, so it does have a cost associated with it. Yep. But that does give you more ability to put Power BI inside an application, for instance, and, ju and just put things a bit more where you want them. Yes. Okay, but uh, will that solve the problem? So for example, I have a screen one uh, or a tab one where I select the filters and those same filters are applied uh, Power BI. Um, like the data visualizations, or do I have to load the data separately and then just pass on the filters? Yeah, so for example, I'm not sure I'm kind of following the the requirement. So, so, uh, so the thing is, uh, I have a web based application, and there's a slicer to select the dates, and it's just a web application, nothing with Power BI. Okay, it, it's yeah. getting data from URL or any of the server. And I just want to, for in-depth analysis, for example, it's just showing a visualization, maybe geospatial visualization, but it's not showing bars and charts, et cetera. And for that functionality, I want to integrate a Power BI. So for example, user selects the slicer or the date, the same uh, date should be applicable to the Power BI and the uh, visualization should be displayed accordingly. That would definitely be a Power BI embedded feature. So it's possible. To, yeah. it, it's possible, yes. Yeah, so there is okay. a cost associated with it. It's not like. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. And, uh, Vivian, if you did want to look into Power BI embedded um, a little bit more, we've uh, we had a chat with um, a company. I think it was on Monday, showing us some awesome examples of Power BI embedded applications. So we're happy to hook you up if you wanted to get a little bit more. Yes, sure, sure. Yep. That yeah. would be great. And I yeah, think, uh, Greg, Nash, is who, Greg Nash is also on the call. Greg, do you want to just talk to what you've posted in the chat? Does that answer that question? Thanks for doing that. I was going to say, Greg's got our back. Uh, well, <laughs> yeah, uh, Daniel was also asking in the chat about uh, uh, interacting with a Power BI iframe in, I think, published to web in his setting, but similar sort of thing. So the JavaScript framework is is for embedded allows you to pretty much do what Vivian was talking about there where you can you've got the iframe that has the the report inside it and then you've got the your website that sort of sits around that and you want to maybe pass through filters or pass through a particular context or have role-based security all that kind of stuff that you want to do may you know interact with a particular bookmark all that uh, sort of programmatical stuff you might want to do embedded inside the the application you can do uh, that so i just posted a link to the um to the intro to the js framework as well cool awesome. thanks thanks, thanks. Uh, thanks so and thanks for your question Vivian, as well yeah great question um no thank you yeah, thank always, you Tim. yeah it's always <laughs> tricky when you go from using power bi um just inside one organization and then you want to start sharing it uh, yeah. on public applications there is a, quite a few things to consider yeah yeah um, I might I might just ask a question for you. Uh, oh, no, we got uh, one. Daniela, Danielle, would you like to ask a question? Um, if you're comfortable, feel free to unmute. Or just type in the chat. Danielle uh, Sivan? Danielle. Danielle.
I am um, just while I think Danny, oh, yeah, feel free to tie. Are you on, uh, you're on, you're mute. on mute? Hi. Hi, everyone. Hi. We can hear you. Oh. Thanks, Douglas. Uh, so uh, I'm Danielle. I moved to Melbourne a few months ago, and I used to work um, more than six years as an analyst. And of course, the market here is much more um, combined with technology. And so during this lockdown, I, I started to learn Python, uh, SQL, and Tableau. And how to uh, how how to gain the knowledge of Power BI and where to start with, because of course there are a lot of websites, but I don't know what particular should I begin with and how to build after that my first project. Yeah, that's a fantastic question, and thank you so much for asking. I think there might be a lot of people on the call in a similar boat. Um, I'll give my uh, my advice first, and then I'll hand it over to the others um, to see how they've learned. Um, the way I learned was using was just by watching the um, edX course. It was a Microsoft course. I'm not sure if it's still it's, available. It's now, I think, the Microsoft Learning Path, yeah. which Daniel's just reposted in the chat. Thanks, Daniel. Yeah, so oh, they have some excellent resources with videos. Um, after completing that, then really try a project, a very simple project, uh, maybe something you've already created another program, and try and replicate it in Power BI. Uh, go on all the blogs. Uh, the top blogs that we love is Gynacube, Radicad, um, Discovery I. <laughs> if you like, PowerBI.tips is excellent. Uh, Read Haven, so Haven's Consulting. Um, there's a lot of different blogs out there, and just try it. The forums are great yeah. as well. And um, Danielle, as part of like the blog that we'll write with the video after this, we'll include a few of those resources as well. So for the benefit of um, you know most people on the call, I know they've also they also run the dashboard in a day, which Greg Nash on the call. I think you oh, yeah. you run it, Greg. So dashboard in a day is a great sort of um, yeah day where you get all all these sort of different elements, these components of Power BI thrown at you, and you get that with different data sets so yeah definitely yeah. look into that as well but uh lachlan and jared being fairly new users what advice would you have uh yeah so i started yeah, all those references that you've just mentioned there that's what i sort of started looking at um and those were really really good i, I particularly found guy in a cube um the most helpful uh and so when i started looking at power bi i had a project in mind um, so as Alice was just saying, I think it's really important to, to know sort of where you're going and where you want to go to. Um, and then, yeah, thirdly, uh, so Christian and Alice uh, run, a, run a couple of trainings and, and I found them excellent. Um, they were only, I think, only two days and I learned, you know, it's really significant amount um, and that was really, really helpful for me. I, I don't think uh, if you're 100% fresh, I think, uh, well, the course that I did was probably for people who have a little bit of experience. Um, so yeah, that I was able to pick that up on the internet, but there might be some more uh, beginner courses. I'm not sure, Alice, but yeah, um, excellent training. Yeah, really highly Thank recommend Thank you so it. much. Yeah. yeah, Lachlan did our semi-advanced Power BI for designers. Um, if you want to, if you're in the environmental industry, we have our water and groundwater and environmental. That's beginner to about six months. Um, Jared, did you have anything to add that sort of hasn't been mentioned as Power BI learning resources? Uh, I think, yeah, the combination of comments covered it pretty well. So I did like a quick half day sort of generic one in Melbourne just to start off with um, understanding what it can do. And then from there, just try some projects and using all those web resources. And then as a water professional, I found the Discover AI one two day course really helpful as well for those, because there's a lot that's tailored to finance, I guess. So um, doing that for water was really handy. Thanks. And uh, Daniel, did you have any, um, being an expert Power BI user since the day it was uh, started pretty much? Um, I, I'd just say there's been some really good links posted on the chat. So um, Kerbal, um, but, uh, Douglas recommended Kerbal. I've just put the uh, website for uh, Ruth's site who runs Kerbal, and she's really, really good. Um, there's also the Power BI community. So there's about a million users there, and there's some incredibly intelligent super users that are very good at any question you can think of, and also just you know um, tailoring it to your skill level. Um, it's an incredibly great community. Um, if you use Reddit as well, there's a Power BI subreddit. They're incredibly helpful. Um, 
Yep, and it's put Dax.tips, which is a guy called Phil Seamark's website. He's a Microsoft employee. Um, and he's got some incredibly great um, tutorials on if you get a little bit more advanced, um, how to do some incredible things with the language uh, DAX inside Power BI. But no, I think the others really Radicad yourselves, Discovery AI, obviously. Um, who else we got? Power BI at Tips, Guy in a Cube. Yeah, I think we've been over all the kind of ones you'd want to start with. And then there's some more esoteric ones. There's a guy called BI Elite, uh, Parker Stevens. He's an MVP. He does some incredibly smart stuff. And once you get a little bit more advanced and looking into DAX, definitely SQL BI. They're known as the godfathers of DAX. But that's probably, I would only look at their stuff after about maybe six months. Um, uh, DAX. Yeah, I should just say Ankit's posted DAX guide, which is by the people that do SQL BI. That's an incredibly good reference. Yeah. Cool. Yes. Yeah, so much information out there. Yeah. So <laughs> finding the time hey. would be good. <laughs> yeah. No, no, thank you so much, guys. No, thank you yeah. for asking that no, question. No, it's, it's fantastic. Question. Um, so we've got a few more minutes. Are there any sort of last last minute questions for anyone? Yeah, or um, any comments or um yeah. anything you'd like to learn next time? I know we've got um actually on the Two of the attendees on the call are Douglas and Phil, uh, who are presenting next time. So thank you for dialing in. Uh, we've got another question. Yeah, yeah uh, Hida? Hida, please go ahead. Hi, sorry again. Um, I find that I struggle with the visual side of Power BI, I'm trying to make it very visually appealing and things like that. Um, especially like you know the questions about the uh, you know color blindness and things like that you know, trying to find that information about making it visually appealing and, and catering to everyone's need, um, especially within my organisation where they seem to be creating templates which are not easy to manoeuvre. So I want to assist with that particular area or issue because I found all of the presentations were very visually appealing and interactive and things, whereas I feel like uh, I'm myself and others might be falling into the just make it full of data reports and stuff rather than graphically engaging. Yeah, that's a fantastic question. And we've seen it a lot with lots of reports, especially reports if you if they're being designed by the data analysts who are really good with the numbers, but they might not be the business users um, uh, or they might not be marketing professionals or designers. Uh, there's a couple of, um, of tips. We've got a blog our top five tips for designing visually appealing reports. Um, I can post a link in the chat if you're keen to check that out. Um, but I would say my tips would be uh, try and use a background. So we found that backgrounds and layouts, um, they work really well. You can make them really easily just in PowerPoint. Um, try to use a standard theme. So you can create your own Power BI theme files using your organizational colors. But you can take it a step further to what's just in the default Power BI um, interface where you can customize it. You can go on to powerbi.tips and fully customize your theme. So you don't have to be good at designing reports. If you have a nice theme, you drag in a visual and all of the uh, formatting for your table and matrix and line charts, they update automatically. Um, oh, thanks for posting in the chat. Alluring Analytics BI has some awesome uh, Power BI uh, kind of background templates, which he's developed using um, PowerPoint. So you, you can take those and adjust those. Um, there's lots of different ways. It's one of my most favorite subjects because we combine graphic design with Power BI. Um, but if you are keen, I'll do a mini plug for our uh, Power BI designers masterclass. Um, that's where we go into all that fun stuff. Oh, one more thing, Data Stories Gallery. That's a great way of um, getting inspiration. Getting inspiration. Yeah. Um, Daniel, yeah. Yeah, sorry, I've just put a few things in the chat if anyone's watching it. Uh, there's a website there, Data Savvy, uh, which is a blog by an MVP called Megan Longoria, who is really, really uh, passionate about accessibility and things like color balance and things like that as well. So there's some really good resources there. Uh, Zebra BI, Zebra BI, they're a provider of custom visuals. They have a really good webinar, which is about an hour long about seven common dashboard mistakes that people tend to make when they're trying to design really rich dashboards. And sometimes it's not about how fancy it is. It's more about telling the story in the most efficient way. Um, and yeah, the Alluring BI website is a guy called Chris Hamill who works at Microsoft and promotes a lot of the visual side of Power BI as well. So he's got some really good resources. Fantastic. Awesome, uh, thanks. Thanks, Daniel.
Uh, Lachlan and Jared, any quick thoughts on design? Uh, you mentioned backgrounds. Um, yeah, that, those would be, that'd be my number one tip. Uh, I think, um, yeah, Lockie mentioned it when he was talking, saying getting a clean professional outcome takes a lot of time. I think that's that's accurate as well. So don't don't expect it like it's going to take a lot of effort to actually get it to look polished. So yeah, it's a lot of little things done right, I reckon. And also making sure you're gathering the sort of requirements from your end users and then being able to apply that. You don't want to just splash visuals all over the page. It needs to be structured to effectively tell that story. So it does take a bit of time and don't expect it just to happen. But um, yeah, if you go to those resources, you have a good range of tips to be able to get started or continue building with it. So. Um, thanks, Doug, for storytelling with data. Um, yep, excellent resource. Is that yeah. Alberto? Who's the author? I forgot. Uh, Cairo. I don't know. Anyway, he's a world global expert in data storytelling. Had lots of tips. Very good. Um, Look, I think we. Yeah, we're, well. we're we're kind of on the um, half hour now. Christian and I were happy to stay around and chat with people. Um, if anyone's keen to ask a couple more questions and have a bit more of a conversation, um, but I'd just like to take the opportunity to thank everyone for dialing in. This has been a whole lot of fun. Um, I think it's going to be a great way for us to create a community around environment and data analytics. So really looking forward to future yeah. sessions. And especially I'd like to thank Lachlan and Jared. Um, thanks a lot for presenting. There's really, really interesting case studies and I think it definitely got the ball rolling in terms of these events with combining that data for the environment industry. And yeah, we'd just like to say thanks a lot for presenting. And great. thank you so much, Daniel, for um, jumping on the Ask the Experts panel at the end. Um, it's nice to be called an expert, but thank you for having me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, you've got such a good um, knowledge of Power BI. So I know we learned so much working with you, but um, thanks for joining in. Yeah, no, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. It's been great. No worries. So we might, um, we'll stop the recording now, but if um, we'll hang around for another five or 10 minutes, if anyone just wants to go off mute, have a chat, introduce yourself. Um, but otherwise, have a great day. Thank you, everyone. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. Thanks for the opportunity. Thanks. No worries.